Um, Sergey's wife would like you all to know that she was not present when we named uh, our slides. <laughs> uh, but this, this is true because you know when you're um, when you're talking to a network service, when you're talking to a web server, or when you're speaking TCP/IP or those sorts of things, um, you know that it's a dumb idea to implement those in the kernel. You know that it's a dumb idea to allow an untrusted third party to talk directly to any software with high privileges. Um, you know that it's a dumb idea to allow an untrusted third party to talk to uh, large regions of code or, or large areas of software. If you have a server and you just install every uh, PHP script you can find online, it'll be about an hour before somebody pops it. Well, the same thing actually happens to USB. It's just that because it doesn't run over the internet, it's difficult to, uh, to tell whether anyone is exploiting it. Um, so I can't tell you whether or not people exploit this, but I can tell you that it's a load of fun to exploit, and I can show you where the bugs are. And I can also show you some of the, the things you might be able to do to, um, to make this less of an issue for you. Uh, super glue in the USB port works great. And just about nothing else does. Uh, so before we begin, we'd like to thank uh, Sergio Alvarez and Dmitry Nenospidov. Um, Dmitry managed to manufacture a prototype for us when the original prototypes had been seized by German customs, and we, we thank him ever so kindly for that. Um, Sergio sort of acted as our, uh, our guinea pig in that he used this framework at the time that we were developing it uh, and pointed out a number of missing features and bugs that, uh, that helped us immensely. Uh, and uh, also a shout out goes to Andy Davis, who published this uh, really nifty white paper called 50 Lessons from uh, USB Bugs. We're going to use uh, some of his examples. Now, we thought about writing such a thing, but uh, good neighbors beat us to it. Yep. And they credit uh, Face Dancer for uh, being a convenient thing to work with. So hey, you know, shout out. So why do we do this? There is this thing we call the rights law. And if you attended the uh, Mike Osman and Dominic Spill's uh, presentation last time, uh, you should be familiar with it. Security doesn't get better until tools for practical exploration of attack surface are made available. Joshua Wright said this at TorCon. Uh, we published it at the next ShmooCon as Wright's Law. Uh, we put it on Wikipedia, and some unneighborly editor uh, deleted it. My students, my students did their best to argue with him, but you know it's their ground. Uh, the rule of the forest, the bear wins. Yeah. This is the original prototype that uh, Dimitri helped manufacture. Uh, yes, yeah, so again, this tool allows you to write your own USB devices on your regular workstation with all of the memory and uh, tools that you have access to. So if when you're prototyping it, you want lots of resources, this is what it, it gives you. It also gives you room for logging. You've got disk access, you've got uh, network access, you can store all of your records in a database, you can store whatever metrics you want. And these are things that you can't do when you're programming an embedded system. Um, and you get incredible flexibility by doing this, these things on the host rather than in the embedded system. Because your exploit doesn't have to fit into 32 kilobytes of code. Plus, you get to realize your fantasy of connecting two computers over USB. <laughs> I mean, you don't know how hard I tried, but those A and B things, all that crap, no, this is the way to go. This is the router. This is the network. So let's think about networks. We've learned to respect one of those ports, right? <coughs> RJ45. We learned to respect it. We put firewalls in front of it. Uh, we look after our uh, local lands and so on. We have not quite learned to respect the other ports. However, if we look at uh, what a network is and what we do to a network, well, we have packets, right? We have layers of abstraction. That's your whole OSI model, uh, from the file layer to the link layer and up. And uh, what do we do to all of those layers? We craft packets, and we send them uh, over that port, and they sometimes do interesting things to applications or kernels. 
also we scan them. And some people make a lively business uh, selling those things that are find weak endpoints. And now you have this thing uh, that you call a bus. And you just ask yourself, well, how similar is it to this network that we know to, how, how to hack? And so you start looking into this. You have really nice uh, TCP IP stacks. Since 1990s, they improved quite a lot. Uh, sending an overlong ping packet does not crash uh, Windows anymore. Uh, having the same uh, source and destination IP uh, uh, for an IP address does not crash uh, kernels anymore. This stack is more or less under control. And then, of course, you have the USB, which uh, can do all so many things. And some of you may remember the time when it was the unused serial bus. But uh, now, of course, if you ask yourself, what hangs on that port? Well, the answer is everything. So all of these different USB devices you can think of as services that your kernel is willing to run, uh, the device drivers being the services. So if you plug in a hard disk, your kernel happily loads the module that implements USB mass storage. And it happily connects you to the SCSI framework of the kernel. And through there, the automator will happily mount any file system that you give it. So you can touch the file system device drivers through USB. Similarly, you can emulate networks, but not just Ethernet cards. You can also emulate Wi-Fi cards. So all of those bugs that came out in 2007 that allowed you to uh, remotely exploit a kernel through malformed Wi-Fi packets? Well, you can trigger those bugs by first making the Wi-Fi card, waiting for the driver to load, and then popping it. But uh, never forget how all of those bugs were actually uh, rendered exploitable. Good neighbors created injection patches. Cards were created or modified and then simply bought when Athera switched to all uh, um, software defined radio, software defined uh, for their radio uh, uh, configurations, that you could just put in a byte buffer, put together a byte buffer, uh, put it into the card, and have it transmitted over the air entirely uh, as you requested. And so once you could inject raw packets from uh, raw byte buffers, uh, you had your hijacking the MacBook in 60 seconds, and all the interesting crashes they could uh, invoke in uh, every Wi-Fi driver and so on. This is the equivalent of an injection-capable card. It takes a buffer, essentially, and transmits it as a packet over USB. And that's all there is to it. And this is the kind of exploration that we invite you to join. So you've got everything. And you know, let's think about what happens when a packet hits a kernel. Sometimes the packet self-destructs. Sometimes it bring, break, brings down the kernel, right? And if you think about it, now that you have a stack which is much richer, you've got, uh, well, possibly a much more brittle stack. And the birds have just gotten angrier, right? Those birds are so damn angry. In fact, uh, let's take a moment for uh, a public service announcement. Do you understand what's going on in this world, right? This seemingly little game glorifies attackers. We should be distributing games called Peaceful Pigs Building Solid Defensive Structures. <laughs> those birds are so damn angry. So let's look at those birds. Uh, TCP IP, these are my favorite slides of TCP IP, uh, my favorite depictions of TCP IP packets, taken literally off someone's back, as those are t-shirts on which they're printed. Uh, not very, not very, um, not very complex. Still cause for much trouble, including fragmentation, including um, various TCP tricks. Okay, so now let's look at structures that are in packets that cross the USB uh, so-called bus. And we hope to convince you that this is actually a network. 
Uh, this, for example, is one of those descriptors which describes uh, a, a human interface device. And you notice things like length fields. These things are variable length types, which might tell you uh, what the uh, lengths are. So here's a typical one. Print that on a t-shirt, right? How many kinds of those descriptors are there? And the answer is many. This is what a typical one looks like. Notice four different length fields in different places and a descriptor uh, length that must agree with them in uh, this other place. So now we're going to play a game. The game is called Guess That Parser Bug. <laughs> so here is a field, here is a string field that uh, has a length that is in the packet, but also the, um, during the uh, setup, you get another bit of information, another field that tells you how long the packets are expected to be. Guess what buffers are allocated based on. Now, uh, that's not all. When you've got two fields that need to agree with each other for the packet to be uh, parsed correctly, um, well, and that's exactly, you, you might uh, expect that the parser will trust at some point that they agree in value. And this is exactly what happens here. There are two length fields. So not only that, but they have to ag agree with each other and you view them as a table as being something set in stone. You read that off of the device, and it's the way that it is. Um, but the device might be asked for this structure more than once. The PlayStation Groove exploit, which allows you to jailbreak a PlayStation 3, that functions by providing a short length the first time, which is when the buffer is allocated, and a longer length the second time, which is when the buffer is copied. And on any legitimate device, these two lengths would equal each other. Um, but because the device is asked multiple times, it's able to lie. And it's able to change its mind in between. And bugs like that are everywhere within these stacks. Now, consider how those stacks are debugged. They're debugged against an actual device, which doesn't know how to lie so many lies. Uh, when uh, you get something that is essentially a raw injection packet capability, well, you know, you can lie uh, with much agility. So let's take a deeper dive into that whole uh, ecosystem. You've got the USB port, and you've got several layers of the kernel uh, that the packet would go through. And uh, you can, it turns out, reach not just the USB-specific code, not just your controller, not just your bus, but also other buses. And uh, virtual uh, buses as well, virtual uh, kernel communication pathways. And uh, if you look at this uh, in even the, in, in the systems like uh, Linux and BSD, well, that code is not pretty. And there is really a lot that hangs on that subsystem. So as a systems programmer, you think, OK, here is my file system code. So I should implement uh, opening files and uh, reading from files and writing to files and maybe some ioctals, some special commands where you put a binary bu buffer and hope that something on the kernel end catches and parses it correctly. And there is a subtraction layer that you're dealing with that allows you to write, uh, to talk to devices uh, that use different uh, command systems such as uh, SCSI or a TAPI, or the mass storage driver. And then it hits uh, the actual controllers. But what happens in, and uh, your uh, SCSI and TAPI drivers are going to talk through that abstraction layer. So again, you trust your abstraction layers. The most interesting thing starts happening, though, when the response hits. So the response goes in the other way, and this is how the device itself actually answers whatever question is posed to it. Um, but there are all sorts of implicit assumptions that the device will behave as the device always has. So it's assumed, for example, that every disk is a block device, 
and that whatever you write to a given block, you can read back as that same block, and that the disk won't move things under the hood. But it's perfectly possible for a disk to change the contents of a file between two times that it's read. And this is how you get time of check to time of use attacks. It's also possible for an emulated device to send longer packets than would ever be sent by the legitimate one, or to, uh, to send data structures with illegal values. And all that requires is that you be able to speak the language, that you be able to get the right socket and then say things across it. And that's what the face dancer allows you to do. So once you treat this game as the game of injecting raw packets, it's pretty much over. Uh, are you willing to bet that the drivers do their sanity checks consistently and check for every condition that could be lied about once it's been believed by a, an, a previous stage in code? Uh, just a little bit of terminology. You've got uh, transfers, you've got uh, transfer sessions, you've got um, uh, protocols encapsulated inside them. You've got uh, SCSI or TAPI commands in particular. And all of that, during the initial negotiation, sets up the routing of the packet through the kernel. So when packets come from the uh, actual port after the setup, they are simply handed to the appropriate uh, piece of code in each respective layer of this system. So you are delivering your payloads all over the kernel. And you can choose any branching uh, to get to one place or the other, one subsystem or the other. So it's as if you're falling down the rabbit hole every time, every time a packet comes in, except you've set up some switches. And you know exactly in which place of this rabbit hole you're going to go to. And then, of course, as you start falling down the rabbit hole, like Alice, you are going to see all the interesting stuff that, if you remember, she sees when she falls down. Uh, some bookshelves, uh, some furniture, pictures, who knows what else. Uh, this picture is so much better on my screen than on this one. So, are you firewalling this? Uh, now, uh, so to consider just how many targets you have, um, have any of you noticed that Linux supports every USB device ever manufactured in the history of time, except for the wireless card in your laptop? <laughs> we can impersonate any of those. And we can target and attack and exploit bad code in any one of those drivers. But for these devices that are so rarely used, the bad quality of that code never affects the stability of the kernel unless that device is plugged in. So it's never a target for improvement or for refactoring. It's a hidden world of hurt. It's a hidden world of pain. Now imagine me being that boy wonder from, uh, what was that movie? Which movie? I see dead people. Uh, sixth Sense. <laughs> I see dead drivers. Um, so this is a, a webcam, and webcams are kind of unique in that they exist both as uh, a standard, uh, which is why the, um, the more modern ones all seem to work, but you also have non-standard ones, each of which requires a vendor proprietary driver. For uh, as astronomic uh, photography, for taking pictures of stars, you really want a CCD camera and not a CMOS camera. So astronomers have been hoarding these uh, Philips webcams from 1999, which uh, have a CCD camera in them. Because of this, Linux still ships, ships with drivers. And when you look at the reviews on Amazon.com, you see these great little statements like, uh, works great with Windows ME. And this is still shipping. Now imagine seeing this on your network. Well, you're seeing code from the same vintage. Now, uh, supposing you think, well, how is this going to hit me? How is this going to be delivered? You know, I'm not plugged in, I'm air-gapped. Then, of course, there is this ultimate uh, sneaker net. 
And on that sneaker net, you see devices like this being brought in all the time. And you can tell that this is APT because these are Chinese letters here. <laughs> and this is indeed. <laughs> this is a, a thumb drive that's been reprogrammed to appear larger than it is, glued into the casing of a larger hard disk. And then they include bolts for weight. <laughs> now, isn't this great? Except, of course, it just turns out if you write a large file on it, uh, only 512 uh, megabytes of it. Uh, and this is done to scam Russian tourists. This is not. Uh, this You're is not done for security reasons. Or if it has been, it hasn't been found. But if you really wanted to do this properly, you would do it with replacement firmware, and no one would notice. And firmware is not all that tough. In fact, you can prototype this in Python, as, as uh, we will show. So why aren't we firewalling that? Why are we making all the zombies in the kernel stand and walk places uh, when we uh, present as a uh, device that just happens to be this sloppy webcam uh, 0 0.0 uh, that somebody written for their course project? We need uh, to do what we do with other traffic that hits the vulnerable insights, the trusted insights of our uh, machines. We need to firewall this. And in fact, we have this excellent business plan. Uh, we're going to take application firewalls and replace them everywhere in text with driver firewalls. And then, I don't know, collect underpants? And profit. Uh, so at this point, we need all of you to sign the NDA that our startup company will be passing around from the back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure your own, your own W has uh, yeah. uh, perfect lawyers. <laughs> uh, but seriously, if you want a scam, this is a pretty good scam to get into. You, know, you could make a ton of money and deliver nothing. And in fact, quite a few people do, because uh, you see the USB protection products. And you ask yourself, uh, which are not super glue for some reason, and you ask yourself, well, how many of the different levels of commands that you can send through the different pathways of the kernel if you control the packet entirely? How many of those do they recognize and trap? And are you really sure that this thing that presents as a SCSI device won't present as an Atapi device uh, just on the next try? which you might not even notice. And even where the restrictions are well implemented, they're still rather easy to bypass. Uh, for example, if you, lock, if you lock a machine down so that it can only take keyboards and printers, well then an attacker can emulate a keyboard and emulate a printer and type the PowerShell commands to print everything out. Um, and there are all sorts of bypasses like this. And the only reason they're not worth publishing yet is that no one's actually using the software to defend the USB ports. But when they do, drive a firewalls. So the only way uh, to understand how uh, something uh, like this works and to actually deal with it efficiently is understanding the actual encapsulation model. And as you start looking at the code, despite uh, many differences, despite the fact that uh, unlike uh, internet packets that carry the address in every packet, and USB doesn't do that. USB sets up all of those uh, pathways at the initial stage, uh, the enumeration of which we're going to talk later. So despite all of those differences, these are still packets. And they map pretty much onto the uh, engineering schema of uh, network protocols and their encapsulation. Of course, you have the electric part. So you start from the phi layer, from this differential signaling uh, on this pair of uh, wires that actually carry the signal in USB. Uh, there is another one for power, um, and uh, you're just about done. <coughs> so what happens if you can mess with that? Well, the tolerances of various controllers are quite higher than the standard, it turns out. So this is uh, even where you can play with the file layer. We have not quite done that. We're using a, an off-the-shelf 
a USB controller chip uh, that plays the role of that card that accumulates the buffer and then sends the packet uh, just as we requested it to do. Uh, from that point on, you have something that looks like a packet fragment in IP. Well, that's the uh, USB packet. And there are many implicit links and uh, explicit information about that length because the devices are just so diverse. Some of them support larger packets. Some of them support smaller packets. Uh, some of them can only do uh, certain things. Others uh, can do a lot more. So you've got uh, this stage at which the packets are assembled into a transaction. And uh, the transactions accumulate to transfers. And you've got uh, the bit where uh, a series of uh, packets are assembled into a buffer that uh, uh, constitutes uh, a higher protocol uh, level uh, entity. But on all of those, we know what to do. We've, been, we've done it to TCP IP stacks. We're doing it to IPv6 stacks. We should be doing this to USB as well because the methodology is the same. The mapping, uh, despite the differences, is uh, quite, and quite surprisingly, uh, similar. After all, these are stacked uh, pieces of code that handle encapsulated wrapped entities. And so let's talk about the physics of how to do this. Uh, so this began when I was teaching um a day of lectures for Sergey's operating systems class at Dartmouth. And I was explaining how different embedded buses work, SPI and I2C, uh, the buses that allow microchips on a circuit board to talk to each other. And he gets really excited on this rant that it's not a bus, it's just a network and there's nothing special about it. And then he asked for a network adapter, for a USB adapter that allows him to just speak it in the raw. So this is our uh, same day prototype. We overnighted this uh, Maxim development kit that's designed for allowing you to write your own USB devices. And then we wired it into a GoodFet, which is a board of mine for exposing SPI to the host. So we're just speaking SPI over a GoodFet to a USB chip. And in the end, you get a Python library that lets you speak directly to the USB chip. And it takes care of the rest for you. Uh, we designed a custom PCB, which promptly got seized by German customs. Um, you're just a little bit worse than Australia when it comes to seizing my mail, but it's another rant for another time. Um, so my, my buddy Dimitri had a PCB milling machine, and he actually carved out a board for me. Um, this is the, the first unit after it's been assembled. And then um, we can now network these machines together through the face dancer with a Python script on one machine implementing whatever USB device we want the other machine to see. Um, we have a couple of limitations as far as how fast we can speak or how large of a packet we can send, or rather how large of a fragment we can send. Uh, but aside from those, we can emulate pretty much anything. So before we uh, take a deeper dive, just look at this uh, beautiful diagram. You should see the lines. This is the MEX controller chip. Now, I haven't done any electronics work in my life, so when Travis says we, it really means Travis. <laughs> but... Um, this was a revelation. Here's a microcontroller, which is programmable in an assembly, I understand. And here is the uh, USB controller chip, which goes to the USB um, uh, socket. Uh, and this is your um, mini or micro, whatever, well, whatever, you, uh, whatever you like. Uh, so electricity comes out properly modulated on those D plus D minus wires right there. Now. What this uh, microcontroller sends, and just basically ferries receiving from the host, is raw bytes. Those raw bytes go on the SPI bus. The three leads over there, up there, are the SPI. So we just bang out serially uh, the bits of a byte. And uh, the controller takes over all the work of transforming them, recoding them, into the uh, electric side of the USB. This is the most liberating thing I've ever seen in my life. Just uh, 
it demystified this uh, entire uh, game for me, if you will. And so, you know, back in uh, uh, a land where I'm much more comfortable, uh, this, is the, this is the protocol that you speak uh, to that uh, MEX controller through that um, MSP430 uh, um, CPU. And literally, uh, you start with saying, OK, the five bits of a register number. I want to talk to register number such and such on the controller chip. And this is uh, banged out uh, ones and zeros, highs and lows, uh, on the SPI bus, which is just a glorified serial bus with a clock. And uh, you can say whether you are writing or reading a particular, uh, that particular register. And then the most important bit, the axtet bit, when you're done with the actual buffer, uh, one of those registers is a buffer, and it will accumulate uh, the bytes that you send over. Uh, the, the, this is the command byte, then there is the data byte, and the data bytes will be accumulated. When you're done, you set the XTED bit, and it says, OK, and it transmits the entire accumulated buffer. So you've built up your packet. It's just that easy. And uh, what this wonderful chip is, well, uh, Travis gave it an acid bath. Yeah, uh, so this is a photograph of the chip. Uh, we have much looser chemical regulations in the United States. So you can just buy a, a couple liters of white fuming nitric acid and take care of it yourself. Um, here they use pine resin because that's like, more environmentally friendly or some similar hippie nonsense. But the, uh, the chip itself is publicly documented. So Maxim publishes two books on this chip. Uh, they're rather short. You can print them out uh, at home. And these books explain everything that you need to know in order to speak to the chip and develop the beginnings of your USB stack. And they also include example code in C for implementing a keyboard and a mouse with this chip. So by taking these examples and porting them to Python, we were able to get our initial prototype speaking USB and pretending to be a keyboard with only a second day of development. And there was much rejoicing. There was much rejoicing. And there were many of those. Uh, this is a, a panic in Xorg, specifically in the NVIDIA drivers for Xorg. Um, because, of course, you get to speak to those. Yeah. You can speak to all sorts of things. The, uh, but when you're, when you're doing these traces, you also want to be able to sniff legitimate devices. Um, the, the traffic that you generate with the face dancer, of course you have a log of because it's running through your own Python code. But the same is not true for a legitimate keyboard or a mouse. So your solutions are, um, are rather varied. This is a transaction log from VMware. VMware allows you to record all serial traffic and then there's a, a graphical interface for viewing the packets later on. Or if uh, the device that you're trying to emulate happens to be supported by Linux, you can just use Wireshark. And Wireshark, out of the box on modern Linux, will sniff USB devices. This uh, is particularly nice because it allows you to decode the packets. So if your own traffic isn't working, you can find your own, the bugs in your implementation more easily this way. Um, because and avoid a couple of unexpected uh, kernel <laughs> panics. Yeah, it, it is terribly frustrating when you're trying to get a legitimate Drive a uh, legitimate emulator working so that you can later fuzz, and before you get to the fuzzing phase, you start kernel panicking your own laptop. Um, which just speaks to the uh, many layers which are trusted uh, to handle the USB packets as if they were the most friendly thing ever that you could ultimately tr trust between the two different code points in your kernel. And you can't. Uh, if someone could steal a bottle of Pellegrino for me, I would appreciate that. So let's see how the devices announce themselves and set up all of their communication pathways with the host. Up to USB 2, up to and including USB 2, the devices are silent if not spoken to. So they only respond to commands uh, from the uh, host. And the host does what is called enumeration. And in this enumeration, 
they send those uh, gigantic C structures, gigantic and diverse C structures of variable sizes that are called descriptors. And there are several layers of descriptors. There are descriptors specific to a vendor, to a class, uh, to a device. Initially, a device starts with a broadcast address. Address is just an integer. But uh, again, think of it as a network endpoint. In fact, there is a thing called an endpoint uh, in the USB specification. And these are like ports. A device has several endpoints, usually four. Uh, the uh, endpoint zero is typically used for configuration. So the host assigns the device number. And after that, a compliant device will stick to that number and not speak as any other device on the same hub. And guess what we could do? So uh, this is the uh, depiction from the uh, Max uh, manuals of the initial um, transaction. Uh, here is the host talking to the device, uh, now that the device is electrically connected. And it says the command get descriptor. And it sends it to uh, the um, broadcast address, shall we call it. The device hears that and responds with the descriptor. Here is the uh, data chunk. Along the way, uh, several more transactions like this will take place. And uh, these transactions will increase, uh, most likely, uh, the size of the packets being exchanged. Uh, they will uh, configure uh, various uh, um, tables in the kernel that will be used to call the right handler functions uh, that when the packet arrives in the kernel. And I think of this as routing. And so should you. You're routing your payload from one uh, point in the code uh, to another. And we have a doctoral student uh, working on uh, mapping this out and uh, on the tools that would allow you to just produce those payloads at will. Then the device accepts the number and uh, the uh, next uh, layers uh, of the protocol uh, get to work. Now, there's one little complication here that the MAX 3420 takes care of for us, um, which is that USB has very strict requirements for how quickly you need to reply to uh, a query. Um, this being a, a speak when spoken to protocol, the USB device is kind of like a child being yelled at by a very patient parent. So long as the child says that he'll clean up his room after the next commercial, the parent will uh, allow him to keep watching cartoons. Now, the child doesn't actually have to do it after the next commercial. He just has to make some sort of an excuse. And in USB, the same thing happens. So if you look at this on the USB wire as opposed to the SPI wire, the only additional thing are these uh, NAC instructions in which the device is replying saying that it's not yet ready to take any new data. Uh, and this allows the good fat, uh, sorry, the face dancer hardware to stall while it's waiting for the host to reply. And this is how we're able to speak USB over USB without any terribly complicated firmware. Or in fact, any timeouts, uh, which would be gruesome if this feature were not implemented by Max itself. But uh, it actually does so automatically. So long as that XTED bit is not set, uh, and the uh, register that is a buffer accumulating your bytes into a packet is not ready to go, it will automatically send those next. And this is just it. And of course, this is an essential feature of the protocol because it was supposed to support uh, very fast devices and very slow devices. Uh, and devices that need to think long and hard uh, before responding with one of those descriptors to a query. So all of this, uh, luckily, is uh, neatly swept under the rug. And uh, you can write USB devices in Python. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not joking when I say that if you can write a web server, you can write a hard disk. A hard disk is not that much more complicated. Uh, in fact, you can write any device at all. And you can present as any device at all. Um, the, uh, Devices have standards. You, know, you, you, you gotta have standards. There are uh, class types which are standardized, 
And this is really the reason why your keyboard and mouse uh, pretty much do just about the same thing under the hood. Uh, but then there are vendor types, which are not standardized at all. Yeah, so each of these has its own quirks and implementation. And beyond that, you have um, competition between the standard device classes and the vendor-specific types. For example, in webcams, there is a standard for a USB imaging device, but it doesn't have all of the features that a given camera might support. So some cameras will have additional features and break from the standard. Others are just too old or too device specific. For some reason, Wi-Fi drivers have not been standardized. There's no good reason why each Wi-Fi card needs to have different drivers than competing vendors, um, but it does. And so as you look through these, you as the attacker have the ability to hit something standardized, in which case you can expect every operating system except for Windows to support it, or something which is not standardized, in which case you might have to load a driver. So if you are a uh, Frank Herbert fan, you might remember the phase dancer race, uh, who, could, who are shapeshifters and could assume any uh, shape whatsoever. But if you can write the web server, you can write a disk. The designs for this, the code and the hardware are all free. The hardware itself, we sell for the cost of shipping or free shipping for students. And uh, I've got a bag of them here. Sergey has a couple, so we can set you up afterward. You do need to solder this device yourself. If you're not yet comfortable with soldering, I suggest that you get two and blackmail someone at your local hackerspace into helping you out. Buy them a beer. So let's talk about the targets. The structure of those bugs is pretty much the same. So you see, there is the neat little uh, interface that you're using as uh, a programmer. And then, of course, there is the ugly uh, backside. First of all, you can exploit uh, uh, enumeration. So this is when you say who you want to be, and the host believes you. Yep. Uh, and well, it used to be hard. Uh, you had uh, great platforms like Tinzi, but you could not really uh, program them fast because you needed to reprogram them before every try. Well, now you don't need to. Uh, so it's a much, much uh, cut down uh, development uh, uh, time. Um, so some simple examples to play with. Um, HRD emulation is the first demo that any given USB platform implements. Whoa. Whoops. Um, so after implementing HID, you know, you're sort of stuck being able to make a keyboard and a mouse, and you want to do something beyond that. So the, the solution, <laughs> the solution to that is to, um, to look for, to first look for embarrassing bugs in HID. Uh, so here's the HID format string bug. The Chrome OS guys found this in um, Xorg. So you know how airlines and, um, and such have all of these kiosks on the seats that run uh, old Linux? Well, Linux until about a year ago had this format string bug where you could have percent, uh, where you could have a format string in the manufacturer or device string. Now, no legitimate C programmer has ever known what percent %n does. Um, but what it does is it says that the object, uh, the, the value that comes after it in, the, um, in the, the parameters of the format string, so if you do like printf with a percent %n, it says that the length should be written to the address that's in that variable. Uh, so this allows you to overwrite arbitrary pieces of memory, which can get you code execution. Now, on modern desktop Linux or on modern uh, Android or on modern Windows, these are rather difficult to exploit. On Linux from 10 years ago, which is what a lot of these kiosks run, they're a piece of cake to exploit. And this is an X11 of all things until last year. Um, airlines have these. You know? Also, when you fuzz HID, you find uh, bugs in the weirdest places. So Skype crashes on OS X if the descriptor for your keyboard is malformed. <laughs> um, it's also handy to do host mode emulation. Our initial prototype did this, but I cut the feature out thinking that it wasn't necessary. 
And then I realized how long it takes to enumerate a device. And I realized that it's really handy when fuzzing a device for vulnerabilities in the device that allow you to, co to get code execution inside of it in order to replace the firmware or dump the firmware. That it's incredibly handy. Um, so the hardware is now available in the Face Dancer 20. And um, it's great. You can, um, you can load these devices up. You can say, speak to a hard disk and just repeatedly request the same sector. And whenever the hard disk crashes, you're already back in the same position without having to re-enumerate. And these device bugs are a lot easier to exploit than host side bugs, because you never have any address space layout randomization. Any data execution prevention isn't for security. It's just because the designers were too lazy to allow you to execute from RAM. Um, and there's this one bug everywhere, which is that devices have this strings table. About a quarter of them allow you to read past the end of it as a memory leak, or a memory exposure. Uh, there's the device firmware update protocol, which the Face Dancer implements. Um, this is how the firmware of your iPhone or your iPod is updated. And on the iPhones, of course, they have uh, cryptographic checksums, and it's rather difficult to exploit this. But that's not true for the other targets. So you can emulate cheap MP3 players, give it a firmware update, and use that to get a copy of the firmware without even bothering reverse engineering the update tool. You can then replay this to reflash the MP3 player, perhaps with a patch. And every old network head is new again, because now you just have a MIPMing router or gateway. Uh, so I tested this by emulating the bootloader from Michael Osmond's Ubertooth. Uh, here you can see the firmware coming across. The host believes that I'm on an Ubertooth. Uh, and he wrote me the nicest cease and desist letter I've ever gotten. Um, Dear Mr. Goodspeed, it has come to my attention that you have created a hacking tool uh, that may be used to intercept firmware intended for deployment to USB devices and that you have used this to capture firmware for my product, Ubertooth One. I demand that you cease and desist reverse engineering and publication of technical information related to Ubertooth One. The Ubertooth firmware is open source and may be downloaded freely. I insist that you instead turn your attention to a proprietary technology that is less widely available and understood. <laughs> I got a phone call when this hit Twitter with a guy offering to lend me legal services and, and to donate $10 to my defense fund. <laughs> yeah. That's not toilet paper. That was drawn with uh, a marker on printer paper, as all proper law firms do. Um, <laughs> You can also emulate mass storage. At uh, the Usenix workshop on offensive technologies in, uh, last year, Colin Mulliner published a description of how he jailbroke a Samsung television. And he did so by having an XML file. The XML file references a plugin by file name. The plugin either ends in .swf, in which it's safe to install, or .so, in which case it's not considered safe to install. Now, a jailbreak for an earlier version of this had simply included a .so back when they were allowed with uh, the Telnet daemon linked into it. And then as soon as you loaded this, you could just Telnet into your television and get a, a shell. So what Colin did was he made 300 megabytes of padding of white space to this XML file. And he made a disk where the first time you read the file, it gives you the .swf extension. The second time, it gives you the .so extension. So when the shell script says, if this is safe, then install it, well, it is safe, but a different one is installed. And this is how he jailbroke the TV. And this is uh, merely scratching the layer of trust assumptions uh, made throughout the kernels. Um, you can also do active disk anti-forensics. So at the 29th CCC Congress, I presented a disk emulator that allows you to tell when you're in a forensics lab. And if you are in a forensics lab, you can behave differently. So for example, the disk can present a blank image and erase itself if it's being read linearly. Because DD reads a disk from the beginning to the end in order. Or there are really fancy tools that read from the end back to the beginning. Um, but they don't crawl a file system in the way that a legitimate client does. So a legitimate client will uh, sort of read parents before children. It follows the directory structure. It never reads a file before the directory that contains that file. 
and you can check for these things. It's also trivially easy to fingerprint on the operating system. Uh, Windows will write a timestamp to the disk as soon as it mounts it. Um, Macs will have Spotlight crawl the disk in order to index it. Uh, Linux will uh, have behavior that varies by the auto mounter, and you can also fingerprint the auto mounter. Windows also has this delightful habit of uh, reading the master boot record nine times, whereas Macs only read it five times because neither of these figured out how caching works. <laughs> uh, one of the first emulators that we came up for this, uh, it was uh, a USB serial port emulator. And um, this is trivially easy. It's the easiest emulator I've ever written. But uh, you start wondering what it's useful for. Well, you can emulate an uninterruptible power supply and order the computer to reboot. You can emulate a modem or a phone or a radio. You can emulate the face dancer itself, because I actually use this USB to serial chip in the face dancer. Plans within plans within plans. Um, I took apart this machine at the top. Um, this is a memory card reader for an election systems and services, uh, sorry, election systems and software voting machine. Um, so this is what you actually use to read the votes out into the workstation at the polling place. And if you dump the firmware from this, it's my first USB serial port. I'm not kidding, that's actually the title. It's for the PIC-16. And you can even find the source code for it by Googling for strings that are found within the firmware image. That's how you start a programming project, boilerplate. Yeah. That boilerplate lives forever. And when you're targeting Windows, um, unmaintained drivers are great, but they're not included by default. Um, however, there's auto installation. So you get the same variety of device support as you do in Linux. You just have to wait for the driver to be downloaded and installed. Um, you also get to choose between the manufacturers of the driver. So the same chip will be sold under different brand names. So you have an Atheros wireless adapter, and you have a Hello Kitty wireless adapter. And because they use the same chipset, your, your emulator will work for either of them. Uh, but between Atheros and Hello Kitty, which is more likely to patch bugs? Hell Kitty. <laughs> Actually, Windows is moving towards user uh, land uh, USB stacks. And this is uh, definitely the way things are supposed to go, given how easy these things are to exploit within the kernel. Um, in Linux, all drivers are included by default. Ubuntu just builds every last USB driver it can, and they're automatically loaded. Um, and there are no loading delays. You can actually scan through all of these and just fill the kernel up with modules it doesn't need. Um, and there's a massive attack surface there. Um, on a Mac, the stack's performance is crap. It's really slow. Uh, Apple is the only platform on which a face dancer can't emulate a device for the computer that it's running on because the USB stack freezes halfway through um, initialization. Um, so you can't emulate a keyboard on your own computer. Um, you also have speed problems. So we're not, able to emulate, uh, we're not able to act as a host all the time on a Mac because we can't always speak to the device fast enough for the device to think that we're still there. Um, and there's a, a lack of driver diversity. So it'll support these devices on the right and keyboards and mice, but that's about it. And any other drivers have to be manually installed. Um, hopefully, Apple will add automatic installation of drivers to the App Store, and then we can start poning them as well as the others. Uh, FreeBSD is a little bit weird in that complex drivers are not included by default. So you have to actually tell it that you want it to load, say, the Atheros driver before it will do anything complicated. Uh, it also has a USB packet filter, um, which at some point might be used to set up firewall-style rules for devices. Um, and, uh, at, uh, West 2012 in Tempira, Finland, Sergey and I published uh, a paper along with uh, a grad student that we work with. And in this paper, we actually mapped through the FreeBSD kernel using dtrace, and we're able to map all of the pieces that were accessed by a given USB transaction. And so we come to the conclusions. Uh, you should be firewalling those ports or gluing them shut. There's way too much uh, code, uh, trusty code, that makes uh, completely unreasonable assumptions uh, that uh, a device would never lie, the device would stay consistent, and so on. Network stack exploration 
mapping, scanning the weak endpoints works for USB stacks as well. So you never need to uh, actually go beyond enumerating uh, what devices might be loadable and then just find the weakest one that you have the exploit for. Uh, this is so familiar to locating a weak service in the um, network. Uh, we're, we've begun building uh, tools to exploit this. Uh, there is a PhD thesis in progress on how to undo this suckage and do the uh, proper stacks that would not be vulnerable. Uh, you could be using a user land stack. Uh, the Windows is moving towards that, and that is definitely preferable because all that mess is at least isolated uh, from your kernel for some definition of isolated. And uh, you should not believe abstractions. Magic boxes lie. Unrealistic validity assumptions equal pwnage. And, of course, other buses. Yeah. Uh, so a few days ago, Sergey came to me and he said, hey, can we do a face answer for PCI Express? And I said, no, is going to beat us to it. <laughs> so we're not targeting the faster buses. Um, but for many things like USB, you don't need to have extreme speed in order to have a functioning emulator or a malicious emulator. And... Uh, these days, you can pretty easily emulate a keyboard, and this is, in, uh, in fact, part of the social engineering kit, if you manage to slip it in. Uh, but the fact is that you need not be limited to the keyboard. If you can write a web server, you can write a disk, and anything that's less complex than a disk. And with that, uh, we leave you with a couple of pretty pictures. <laughs> So thank you very much, Travis, Sergey. Uh, I think I'm happy that I own a Mac, uh, at least for now. OK. <laughs> um, other questions? Maybe one or two? Just a short question. Is there any difference between USB 2.0 and 3.0? Yes, there are significant differences. Unfortunately, I only know USB 2.0. Uh, USB 3.0 allows the device to preemptively start a transfer so that it doesn't have to wait on the host to begin the transaction. Uh, it's quite likely that bugs will be found in that area. Um, although if you want a USB 3 face dancer, you're going to have to wait on Mike's project because ours won't be extendable into that. Yeah, that, that bus is just too fast. Uh, just a quick comment. Um, I just wanted to say that all the Android devices out there have an equivalent chip to your Max, uh, Maxim. Um, there's a mentor graphics chip that can do a lot of the emulation stuff that you're doing. So all Android devices are capable of emulating uh, devices like kind of what you're describing. Uh, we've heard reports of neighbors going around offering to charge up people's phones. <laughs> <laughs> That's very neighborly of them. Uh, Google COS cable for the COS. Well, he's, uh, he's done a bit of evil that way. <laughs> Okay, so uh, just to make sure that we're staying in time, um, Travis, Sergey, thank you very much. And if you still want to ask questions, I think the guys will be available in the break, so um, feel free to, um, to ask them.